and uh, I want to thank uh, very deeply Paolo Diasis and uh, everybody here for the organization of this event regarding the relationship between philosophy and music more probably than the relation only between Deleuze, Guattari and music. What I uh, want to say in making this distinction is that I believe that if you are interested in the way that uh, Guattari and Deleuze could help you to build up a philosophy of art <clears throat> for today. So the first thing to do is not to give any damn attention to periodization it itself. Because periodization does not exist in itself. Periodization is only the cut, or I would say the montage, really the cinematographic montage, that you do when, as a reader, you try to understand something, and when, as a reader of philosophy, trying to understand a practice that is an artistic practice, you try to do the mix between concept and effect. So, periodization is not a matter of history of thought. And I would like to uh, emphasize this point because I believe in the beginning of this uh, beautiful conference we heard that it was important for musicians and for philosophers to be sure to make, uh, be sure to build the possibility of an encounter between artists and philosophers. But I would very <clears throat> much like you to follow my point and um, my position would be there is no such a problem of encounter between philosophy as an academic, boring discipline for specialists at one point and on the other point building an encounter with artists being uh, uneducated monkeys capable of, you know, transforming society, but uh, unusual, unusually using their mind in order to do something else that uh, are expressing themselves. Um, and so this is exactly the same wrong question as the question who uh, tries to um, understand the fact whether Deleuze is or is not a historian of philosophy. It's the same rubbish question. Deleuze is and is not a historian of philosophy for a very simple reason. He is a philosopher. And so sometimes he speaks about philosophy, sometimes he doesn't. When he speaks about philosophy, what he does shall be interesting or not. If it is interesting, it is philosophy. If it's not interesting, and if it's boring, if it's repeating what you probably have uh, understood by yourself if it's boring, so it shall be called history of philosophy. So there is no difference whatsoever between history of philosophy and philosophy. The only main difference is between the stuff that is interesting and stuff that is not. And so <clears throat> with this introduction, I will try not to be so boring, but then you can understand that our contemporary way to revitalize Deleuze and Guattari is not a historical one. It cannot be. I mean, either it's interesting for us to think with them, and then we are doing our own stuff, or it isn't. <laughs> and so I'm going to try to be uh, interesting, if it's possible, and to be interesting regarding uh, an issue that is that I do consider today uh, to be the most important issue of nowadays, and that is an issue that neither Deleuze nor Guattari could address, simply because they died 30 years ago, or 20 years ago. And so that we are building something that is for today, we may use some of their concepts, sometimes we may not use them, but anyway. And this, uh, this issue is digital art or I would say it is digital culturing. It is these digital devices that we are thinking with. And this is transforming not only art whatsoever. 
I'm looking here in this beautiful building where you have this kind of fresco that is a, 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 appearing. Is it a fresco or is it only a construction? I believe it's a fresco. So you have something from the past illuminating this architecture that is yeah, probably uh, a religious one. And uh, in this device, you have all these capturing elements that are connected with our contemporary situation. This is digital art. So my first point on uh, explaining to you what digital art may be is to ma make this very simple statement. Nowadays, every art, in every form of art, has been digitalized for the very simple reason that the type of relation we have with ancient art as well is this digitized. So my, my first point is to, to claim that the way that we do organize our relationship with what is called art today has something to do with this very curious transformation of our social subjectivities involving Mr. Thank you. But not only you. As a human, this kind of subjectivity, which is totally part of our business today. So we've got to think about this in philosoph in philosopher, as philosopher. I'm concerned with the fact that they put a glass of water at my, my feet. That I'm pretty sure that I'm going to... Okay. So, so <clears throat> this digital environment has something to do, of course, with the new type of subjectivities. And these subjectivities, uh, you have to understand that they are linked with some type of understanding psychic transformations that we were used to regard as only human. So the first grand transformation of this digital world is that this kind of subjectivity that you were used to understand as merely or sometimes only human has to be extended not only maybe to other living forms but also to what we call technical objects. So, technical objects also is something that is related to a certain mode of existence. And when I say mode of existence, I don't only want to express that they transform our modes of existence. What I want to say is that they have their modes of existence of their own. And so it is not a vitalism. I'm not extending subjectivity to animals, to living forms, animal plants. It is not a technophilia, a certain kind of a weird vitalism extended to technical object as if I would be talking to my cell phone. In fact, I do, but something else. It is the way that we have to think existence not only at a mode that is given once and for all type of existence, but that we have to pluralize the modes of existence and we have to open them to what was called technical objects. And this is the second point of my main discourse. Because it is quite complicated for us who were involved in philosophy of art to be capable to understand that there is no such distinction between art and technique or technology. And this is a very important thing to understand that we are, we have we have been, uh, we quitted, we have been, um, uh, nous sommes sortis, we, Camini, nous sommes sortis, we, yeah, right. 
we left uh, the situation of philosophy of art. We left what I called the art machine. This art machine refers to the slow individuation of art in Western cultures. Because you may think that art has always existed. And so if you do so, you are obliged to put into art a lot of devices, transformations, events that were not, that were not meant to be part of the Western system of art during, let's say, the, uh, during the, from, from the 18th till, I would say, the beginning of the 20th century. And I believe that with uh, digital art, we, we left this art machine that was really characterized by the fact that we can distinguish between art and technology and regard art as something that has been not meant to be useful. This is, of course, um, a, a process that um, I do consider to produce on the same time art as being disinteressment, désintéressant, art as being non-useful, and technique as being useful. So I do consider that technique and art were in individuated themselves at the same time, first in the early Renaissance and then by the creation of aesthetics in the 18th century. And if you don't agree with me, and if you say, yes, art previously existed even before the constitution of, of, this, individu in, of this individuation in, in Western regime, if you claim that art exists pre previously, if you claim that there has been a process of autonomy of art, then you are obliged to maintain that there is, distinction, that there is an, a, a, a distinction, a, a real difference between spirit and body, between need and soul, that is, between culture and nature, and even more, between Western cultures and others. So there is a Eurocentric position when you claim that art is as something that is the spiritual agency of our cultural devices, only capable to maintain spirituality and bodily effects out of the technical devices. And therefore, I believe that we have to consider digital world as a possibility to understand a relationship where human technological environment, socio-aesthetical capacities has to be think together in order to understand what for instance, music or cinema shall be. And this is a huge transformation of our discourses on art. And this huge transformation has, in a, in a way, always have been, always have been um, taken in consideration, for instance, by a musician. I believe that what I'm talking about is very easy to understand for people who are into music. Because what musician would say that music is independent from its instrument? And so, if we do consider that the relation between technique and art is a relation where technical devices are producing sensory matricities, producing sensory matricities that are not something that is added to our natural body with this distinction between nature and culture, but that this sensory matricity is a capacity to, for us to bring effects that are not human-like effects, but 
effects that take in consideration this ecological, technical capacity to transform reality. And when we do take in consideration technicity as sensory matricity, then we have a new definition of what we may call, regarding Deleuze's definition of cinema, an image. And this is my third point, image, sensory matricity, and technology. You may recall that in his cinema books, Deleuze very mysteriously argue in the beginning that image should be taken not as a representation, but as an existence. So, if you take this seriously, it is quite difficult to understand it completely. And when I say image, I have to immediately I have to explain that I don't mean by that visual image only. There are sound image as well. Huh? As well, uh, you know that we speak not only from landscaping, but also from soundscaping. But then I would suggest that we have to put these scapings together. Not only landscape or soundscape, but let's say videoscaping. And when I say video, I don't mean only this scopocentrism of the theory of theoria, the scopocentrism of the vision. When I say video, <coughs> I mean the digital capacity to scan or to code on the same level, something that is regarding the vision, the human vision, and something that is taking in consideration the human ear. But then a video signal is together heard and seen. And this is probably the most crucial thing to, 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 to try to understand philosophically. The fact that it's not only a signal that is recoding something that should be eye or vision and another stuff that should be sound or ear. Of course, we have two eyes and two ears. I mean, most of the time. Uh, it's my case. Uh, this ear is better than this one. And my eyes are not so good anymore. I'm using this type of technological input. I'm using it in order to read. So my two eyes and my two ears are not only coupled on my head it, as a certain system of faciality, as uh, wasn't what I would put it, in Thousand Plateaus, they are not only coupled on my skull. They have to be considered as capacities to cut into a continuum of sensory motricity. And that is the reason why human eye, human ear, has been always completed with socio-techno-aesthetical devices that are both to be considered as regime of science and as I'm looking for the world in my memory. It's going to fall down. Regimes of science and, as Foucault was, would put it, équipement de pouvoir. Equipment is a little bit tricky to translate, so I looked for it. For it. Power facilities. Equipment being, you know, like roads, stairs, capacities to form subjectivities. Now, 
The main thing about digital art is to understand the type of relationship that our so-called natural body have with this type of transformed reality. But in order to make you understand my point, I'm going to give you an example that is related with this fine city of Ghent. My example will be, I don't have it present, but I'm going to try to make it present in your memories. My example is the magnificent altar piece of Jan of the brothers Van Eyck. So not only Jan, it's uh, his brother also. And my question would be, how is it interesting to consider the art machine not only as something that is related to autonomy of art, but something which implicates completely a certain kind of machinical or technical capacity. And so my question is, is such a piece, is it, is it a tableau? Is it something that we can call a piece of painting? And my answer is absolutely not. It is not a painting. Why not? Of course it is paint. It has been painted. But it has been painted more as something that has something that has something to do with woodcraft. Did you see this painting? This retable, this polyptychon? Have you seen it in Gans Cathedral? Let me explain to you how it does work. You have God in the middle, God the Father. And on his right, you have the um, Johannes the Heilige, you have the Saint John. On the left, you have the uh, Virgin. And underneath, you have another domain where you have the paradise and the sacred lamp, a certain type of mutton, lamp, mutton, that is like the holy piece to be eaten and the mystical lamp to be worshipped. But then this central piece is not the main topic of this incredible machine because it has two wings and the wings can be opened and closed. On the wings, you've got other paintings. And so it is not one painting. It is a multiple of images. It is more like a video installation because it is quite impossible to focus on one part of the painting. So it is not one painting. It is really like a furniture. And the wings can be opened and closed. More, even more. The inside, it is a box. The inside of the box is colored. But the outside is gray and black and white. It is like anticipation of television, right? Because the outside has to be black and white for ordinary days. And like a cupboard, you may open it in certain sacred days. And when you open it, the wings go like this. And then what you see is a kind of devastation of color that was in the, in the Middle Ages, in the early Renaissance, something that has been, I believe, so incredible as if people who had taken LSD because of this incredible inflation of color. And so is this a painting that has been meant to be in a museum? Absolutely not. It is not one painting. It is merely a piece of furniture, a mode of subjectification. It is, it is I would say, an elevator. It is a box, an aspiration for, the, for religious purpose that is capable to, to take your soul and to put it on the last level of paradise immediately. So it, it has a functioning, as a really <clears throat> machinic functioning that I do describe very quickly here, but what I say is serious. And uh, maybe you're not used to consider painting as this type of machinic devices, 
And if you're not, it is because your eye has been formatted, has been formed, educated by museums. And maybe you don't know that this type of religious, not art, this kind of religious uh, power, equipment, this kind of uh, religious uh, capacity to, to produce Christianity has been cut in pieces after the beginning of art history and museums, so that if you have a, such an altar piece, you can have 20 little paintings. And if you cut them in two, you have 40. And so what you see in museums are only these little bi-dimensional tableaus that were completely created out of this type of ancient cupboards. And so my idea is that when we speak about art history, when we don't take in consideration all this type of all this type of uh, machinery, this uh, quite theatrical installation, so we don't understand nothing. And this is one of the reasons why I do love so much uh, Guattari and Deleuze, because they are completely capable, Guattari more than Deleuze, I believe, to, 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 to take seriously this uh, historical capacity of not art, but art machines to transform our modes of subjectivation. And so, from the late Middle Age or the early Renaissance to our contemporary world, what has changed? Everything. Everything has changed. And so, if you come up with one concept of art, and if you do believe that with one notion, one spiritual notion, one essence of art, you may explain anything, so you're completely out of the question. And this was the, re the reason why I did emphasize this point, that art is not one. And I believe that if you are interested in music, you have an early understanding of this incapacity to cut between human spirituality and machinic sensory motricity. Because there is, let's say, body without organ, instrumental body without organ of musicians. So that it is not only something for today to understand this relation between technique and art. It is not something that is only a matter of our contemporary art. It has always been the case. I mean, once you have understood it for nowadays, you can realize that it was the case, but that we had mechanical, or let's say, me um, a mechanical um, um, relationship between, let's say, hand and a skin, exactly as you had this type of relation between, let's say, a hand and some pigments. And so that art has always been capacity to form a kind of symbiosis between not one body and one device, but between a transformed collective body, including mechanical devices and chemical devices. But then today, we have to add something more. Not only mechanical and chemical, but we have to take something more in consideration. We have to take electronical capacities of symbiosis. Not only body and forces on a mechanical level, not only bodies and transformation of material on a chemical level, but on a quantic level, a completely different type of relationship that is not in the Cartesian space and time anymore, that is not in this universe where space and time can be considered as the frame of material objects, but in this new type of time and space, electronical, energetical world where matter and energy are combined, 
in order to form the type of body that are that are our contemporary bodies. Therefore, I am connected to this little animal, which is probably <coughs> more my master than I am his owner, uh, because I received just a call 20 seconds ago, and I can check that somebody is trying to uh, trying to get in connection with me uh, through the cyberspace. And then, because I have been talking without looking at my watch, and I believe that it's time to stop, let me, sum let me summarize what I have tried to do. I wanted to talk about Tanya Moreau and about Georges, but then I forgot to bring my USB key, and this is in relation with the fact that I'm completely jet-lagged because I came from a oh, white, white, country, I came from Japan, and this capacity to, to have this type of sensory matricity is related to what I'm talking about today, this digital capitalistic new type of subjectivities that we have to think. Let me give you some um, indications. I would say that this type of new digital capitalism is not, not anymore connected with schizophrenia as we read in Thousand Plateaus and, and in Anti-Oedipus. I would suggest that this type of cognitive capitalism is more connected with autism. Autism and capacities of calculation and of capacities of effects that are incredibly narrow, incredibly quick, and, that, and with a kind of um, sensory motricity that we have to take in consideration. I talk a lot about sensory motricity, but let me explain it to you. We are used to consider art only related to, 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 to senses, not to matricity. But uh, if I ask a musician, do you need matricity to produce music? What would you say? Of course, music is related to movement, right? Now, if you do understand this for music, you do understand that even for poetry, sens 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 sensitivity or sens sensibility is related to matricity. Now this is a very important issue to decide what is, what is to be taken as, at first. Is it the sensory that is the most important or is it the motricity? I would argue that it is the motricity. And so that we can consider images as movements. This was, of course, one of the reasons why Deleuze put sensory and motricity together in his conception of movement, sensory, movement, motricity, image, sensory, right? So he took sensory motricity together in this concept of uh, movement image. <clears throat> but I think it is very crucial to decide if you want to think that perception came first or if you want to consider that motricity is more important. And I would argue we have to say that motricity is more important because if we say so, so we can understand that perception is never opening on a given world. So that perception, and when we are talking about art experiences, perception is not to perceive a new kind of world. Perception is to create or to construct science that is technomotricity, elaborate products of experience, so that we do not perceive another region of experience. We do produce it. And this is the reason why art is important. Art is not only important because it gives us a better 
or a profounder or more spiritual way to understand our world. Art is not important because it would be a door, a mystical door to a better reality. No, art is important because it is the only way that we have to be capable to construct on a collective way the type of modes of subjectivation we are into. And insofar, because we are capable to construct them, because we are capable to construct them and put them as effects outside our zones of experiences, because of that art is not an imaginary doubling of reality. No, art is part of reality itself. It is not the only way to achieve reality. This would be idealistic. But it is the only way that we have to do as not a given community, but to do as a collective that is trying to understand the way that we can transform our reality. So the real capacity of art is to give us, to give us the possibility to understand how experience has to be formed and is not something that has previously been given to us by some kind of God. So in this type of consideration, art has only a political value and it has the political value to make us capable to try to re-singularize, to transform our modes of existence and to transform them in a way that seems better for us tomorrow. Thank you.